Good morning, Fairfield. Uh, it's actually about six o'clock on Friday, and I'm finishing up a little bit of work, and then I'm gonna put this video together for you all, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and I'm certainly glad you're here watching with us. Uh, this is gonna be our Fairfield Friends Meeting for Worship, Home Edition number three. And uh, I hope you're all staying safe and, and healthy in these very difficult times, uh, very different times. Um, I've noticed uh, as I'm sort of finishing up some, some work here, uh, even in work emails, we sort of have to acknowledge that the situation is, is uh, making life a little different. So, um, and it's a little interesting, it's a little kind of funny even to say um, some variation of acknowledgement, like you can't just say, dear so-and-so, please send me that invoice again, I've lost it. Instead, you have to uh, say something kind of poetic uh, even uh, something like I hope I hope you and those close to you are managing to stay safe in these these anxious and unsettling times and I was wondering if you could send me that invoice um, I've even seen some that are more ambitious I urgently hope you are well and able to find tiny moments of solace in these dark and uncharted waters and please send me that invoice life is definitely a little different in all kinds of ways uh, but I'm glad that we could be here together, even virtually. We've had a lot of great help this week with, uh, with this video. Um, I wanna definitely thank the, the folks who, who were able to contribute. Um, we'll have some centering silence, we'll have some announcements and joys and concerns, a uh, message from Phil. Uh, we have some more music by Ike Homan, and uh, this week Lee Edmondson is gonna play for us too, so I think it'll be really nice. Also, earlier today, Laura, Jack, and I ventured outside to go back to the Fairfield Meeting House, and we got some footage of just some of the flowers and just the natural environment uh, surrounding the Meeting House um, to provide some, some visual for the centering silence and, and the silent worship later. So I hope you enjoy that. With that, here's our opening thought from Mike Goss. Good morning, friends. My daughter Andrea posted a photo on Facebook this week. It was a photo of a thank you card that she'd received from a neighbor. It was a thank you card from an elderly woman whose backyard abuts Andrea's backyard. As I said, she barely knows the neighbor's name, but Andrea had decided to take a bowl of soup to this older neighbor, a woman whose husband is uh, in a nursing home at the present time. Well, she got back her pan and she got back the thank you card. She got back the thank you card from this woman, woman for the soup that she had sent. But in addition to getting the pan back and the thank you card, she also got some candy for Andrea's two boys. Andrea's boys are 15 and 12 now. Now, the neighbor actually has never met my grandsons in person. But she's watched them grow up in their backyard by watching them through the window of her home. And when she sent that candy and the, the pan and the thank you note back, there was a note for the boys as well. With the candy, there was a note that said, for my boys, we love you. For my boys, we love you. She said that even though, as I said, she's never actually met the boys in person. I tell you this story not to brag about my, grand, my, about my daughter, rather, who took some soup to a neighbor, although I'm proud of her for doing that. I tell it to you to make the point that here is a woman who is so eager for connection that she calls boys that she has never even met, my boys. I've got a query for you. Who might be watching you through their virtual window, hoping for a connection? And what might we do about it? The people who are watching us, hoping for a connection, how can we reach out and make that connection more real? Thank you and have a wonderful day.
Friends, I'm, I'm glad to welcome back Ike Homan, who's going to play Tchaikovsky's theme on the piano for us. Please enjoy. Thank you, Ike. Friends, now it's time to share our joys and concerns. I want to say thank you to all those who sent in their joys and concerns, and, and uh, we've uh, enjoyed seeing them and collecting them, and, um, and we're happy to share them with everyone now. Um, I will start, though, with uh, a joy. This is my sister. That's Holly Marshall. Uh, she's a registered nurse and clinical supervisor at IU Health. Um, IU Health has a drive through clinic for IU Health employees and uh, other healthcare professionals who were screened virtually and uh, warranted a, a, uh, an in-person test. Uh, my sister was part of the team who left her regular job and responsibilities uh, and uh, suited up and, and oversaw that, that operation. And I'm really proud of her. Um, uh, yeah, I was concerned that you know, she was potentially exposing herself, but she took all the proper precautions and uh, really helped out with, with that team. So I'm really proud of her. Also, I want to thank Tom Farrington. Uh, Tom works very hard continuing to send out these emails back and forth to keep us all connected to each other. Um, these videos wouldn't be happening without Tom and his forwarding of the reminders for folks to come see this and um, my requests for joys and concerns. And, uh, and that's just me. They're, he's doing so much for us. So Tom, thank you so much. Um, the, you, you, make, you, you keep the wheels turning around here. So we appreciate that. Um, I want to read some that have been sent in to us. Herb and Stacy Denny write, my mom and Denny fell and broke her right foot in three places. She required surgery and has been healing pretty well so far. We will know more about her. Sorry, we'll know more after her next doctor's appointment. We're very thankful that my sister Betsy was able to get her the care she needed and that her fall wasn't any worse and that she continues to be in good spirits. We love you, Mom, and G-Mama, and get better soon. Love, Herb, Stacy, Olivia, Will, and little Yap Yap. Don and Lynn Adams just learned Thursday that one of their neighbor's daughters has tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. Her name is Jennifer McPhee Van Hooser, and she's a nurse. Her husband, their three teenagers, and she have been quarantined in their home in Plainfield. Prayers would be appreciated. Before we pass this to a few others, Joanne Gully shared a video joy that she would like everyone to see. Day two of Madeline riding her bike. You can do it. She's learned how to turn a loop. Good morning. Mary Lee Comer writes, Julie Jones Kendall's brother Robert died on March 28th. Katie and George Gandolfo both have COVID-19. Katie seems to be improving. George was in the hospital with a serious heart condition and contracted the virus there. He is still hospitalized. Linda Bryant writes, I came home on Monday after a central line was placed in my chest for antibiotic infusion. Devin, who is now one of my home health aides, met me here to help me get settled. 
I am no longer confined to my wheelchair, but can walk with a walker. I'm doing fairly well with pain control. The biggest challenge is meal preparation. My two little dogs are home and the other two will be home this evening. The nurse was just here to remove my wound dressing. It feels good to have that off. I will have a home health aide for a few hours nearly every day. Thank you again for the cards, thoughts, and prayers. I wish you weren't all stuck at home. It would be nice to see you. Peace to you all, Linda. Joanne Gully shares the concern. Philip and I have two neighbors who are experiencing some serious health issues. If the meeting would hold Brian and Joe in the light, she would be grateful. Hi there, I have a concern from Deborah Hunt. Uh, her friend's 17 year old son ran away this week. Uh, he's on the cusp of graduating in May. Um, her friend does not know where her son has gone or how he's doing. Uh, it seems he was tired of being cooped up and decided that his mom was exaggerating all the COVID-19 uh, things going on. Um, she doesn't want their names bandied about, but prayers for them would be a good thing. Um, also prayers for anyone not taking the COVID-19 uh, epidemic seriously. Uh, Deborah reports that she's at Methodist Hospital hiding behind her mask, looking at the empty corridors and behind her other staff are getting fit tested for their masks. Uh, the hospital is discharging and relocating all patients with smaller problems to make room for COVID patients and it, it feels like a calm before the storm. So let's keep Deborah um, and her friend and her friend's son in our prayers this week. Alma Pierce's cousin Jack Butler was placed on a ventilator recently as he has COVID-19 so please hold Jack in your prayers. And my friend Olya, who lives in Ukraine, her two and a half month old son, Orest, um, is in the ICU. He has double pneumonia. He's still on oxygen and they had to do surgery uh, to remove a cyst from his tonsil yesterday. So if you could please hold Olya, Orest, and their whole family in the light, that would be wonderful. Tara Stewart writes of a concern and a joy. Um, the concern heavy on their hearts is that their close friends, Adam and Tracy's father, Dave Mansfield, is having complications from surgery. Wednesday, he underwent an attempt to fix leakage. The original surgery that he had was actually the second attempt and lasted over 14 hours. Um, they aren't able to help Tracy's mom because of the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, Tracy is also pregnant with her first child and Tara says, like herself, is pushing 40. Stress and anxiety are heavy for them right now. Adam's two boys are with their mother for spring break, which is also adding to his worry. Uh, they are so very precious to Tara and Craig. Tara also shares a joy. Craig helped make a desk in the window of her craft room in February. It's lovely and the perfect setting for working at home during this time. She's bought a bird feeder in the front yard and she's able to sit and watch the birds. Uh, Tara recommends if you're home and you can get a feeder, black oil sunflower seed is the best for all types of birds. Um, she says it's so peaceful and she is also grateful that Craig laughed a few months ago when he came home and she had torn out the window seat. Greetings from Colorado. We really miss our fail field friends. We do have a joy. We just bought a house and we move in at the end of the month. And we have a concern that we will not get the house done in time to move in. And we also are concerned about Tim contracting the virus at work. There are several outbreaks there. So I'm personally a little more concerned than Tim is. Another concern that we have to share is Patty Bowling has lost her job as of April 3rd and along with losing her job she is losing her insurance which is so critical since she does have diabetes. We will hold Patty in our thoughts and prayers. Jill Wiley also has a concern for her friend Kim who needs our prayers. Please hold her in the light. I just want to say I miss you all terribly and look forward to coming back after this is all over and visiting with all of you. I couldn't do that after we moved here because it was too painful. 
So again, I know I owe a lot of you some phone calls, but we've been very busy here. Um, I hope you are all staying safe and we love you. Hello, I'm JB Simons and Philip has asked me to share a prayer with you during joys and concerns during the next worship experience that we share. Uh, one of my joys that I've had recently uh, listening to Wintley Phipps, who is an inspirational speaker and wonderful singer. You can find him on YouTube. Uh, he, he sings with the Gaither Group and many other places uh, in great demand worldwide. Wint Wintley Phipps. One of the songs he has been singing is You'll Never Walk Alone, which I think is appropriate for joys and concerns that we are in a time when we are asked to walk alone, be away from other people, stay apart from other people. But at the same time, I hope that most of us know and, and believe that we are not walking alone. In our friends meeting in Fairfield and other Quaker meetings around the country and other uh, worship services around the world, people are finding that they're not walking alone, that the fears that they have, they're not alone, that the joys they have, there are others to share with. One of the fears that I have or concerns that I have, I guess, is my 90 year old mother who is cognitively doing pretty well, but physically she is uh, in trouble. And so that is my prayer to share with you as we walk together, not alone. And that uh, one of the other songs that uh, Phipps has sung was from an English songwriter by the name, the name of Kendrick. that says, no fear, no need for fear. Fear is um, an acronym for future events appearing real. And right now, there's a great deal of that fear that appears very, very real to us as some of our friends and loved ones fall victim to the virus and other issues that we're uh, prone to. I don't have a list of your joys and concerns, but I know they're there. And I want you to know that you're not walking alone. I walk with you with your joys and your concerns. That is my prayer, that we are not walking alone. And as we walk through the storm, we hold our head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. May God be with you, may God bless you, and may you all know that you do not walk alone. Amen. Okay, it's time to take a little hand washing and birthday greeting break. Uh, we want to wish a happy birthday to Bruce Baroud and Caden McClure this week. So we're going to do the whole thing since it's just two names. That's the perfect amount of time to wash hands. So, <clears throat> a happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Bruce Baroud. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Kid McClure. Happy birthday to you. It's public health. It's very important. Anyway, happy birthday. That's how long it should be uh, taking you to wash your hands. So we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to go ahead and share announcements now, and then we'll end with Phil's message. Uh, YouTube has let me see that folks tend to drop off right after Phil gets done talking. So... People missed out on our announcements and other important things. So we want to go ahead and do the announcements now, and then we'll have Phil's, uh, Phil's message. So folks wanted, to, wanted me to share the acapella group Winborn is now offering Wednesday happy hour, Wednesdays at 530, and brunch with Winborn on Sundays at 1130 a.m. on Facebook Live. Uh, the shows will include music, stories, and trivia, and there's going to be a link to that posted in the uh, description below this video. That's another thing. If you are curious about anything, you hear links or addresses or anything like that, just scroll down. You can pause the video, scroll down, and um, in the description of the video, there is a ton of helpful information. Randy Horton shared, 
You've probably already heard that in response to the pandemic, the federal government has approved an economic stimulus package that includes direct payments to individuals and families. I would like to suggest that those who don't necessarily need that money give it to someone who does need it. Becky and I know many younger people, some with dependents, who have lost their jobs in the restaurant business. We intend to share with them if and when it happens. There are a few we will be supporting regardless. Thank you, Randy, for sharing that. Jimmy McClung recorded a short video announcement for you all to share. Thank you, Jimmy. This is a reminder that the financial needs of Fairfield Friends meeting continue in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic crisis. We need to pay our pastor and our meeting house needs to be heated and insured, even if we are not there. Thank you for understanding the need for this gentle reminder. Payments can be made to Fairfield Friends meeting on paypal.com or you can send a check to Karen Held. If you want to des designate part of your check to Outreach Committee, please indicate this on the memo note. Remember, Outreach is concentrating on local and Fairfield family needs at this time, as well as continuing to support the Cunot Food Pantry, or having sent their budget of 2020 funds to Family Promise and Stability Builders Network. Also, I want to share that I've made the decision to set up AutoPay through my bank account so that my offering gets mailed every two weeks. My mom filed my 2019 taxes for me and I will get a refund. Also, I'll get the stimulus check everyone else is getting so I feel fortunate because this will make up for the fact I'm not working at AMC for now since movie theaters have closed. I want to encourage each of you to consider setting up something like this. He may not be able to give very much, but if everyone pitches in, we can get through this together. I miss my Fairfield family and can't wait until we can be together again. This is Jimmy McClung, recording this from my apartment in Bloomington. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, we cut part of that out because uh, we wanted to protect the privacy of the home address of, of Karen, um, but folks who wanted to, uh, to mail their donation to Fairfield can do so to Karen Held, Fairfield Friends Meeting, P.O. Box 45, Canby, Indiana, 46113. And again, that information will be in the video description. And I wanted to remind folks that electronic giving to Fairfield Friends via PayPal, you can send your donation to fairfieldgiving at Gmail, and you choose the send the money to a friend option. So we're going to have our second piece of music today from Lee Edmondson. Um, today being Palm Sunday, Lee chose to play the hymn Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Please enjoy this piano performance by Lee.
That was so nice. Thank you so much, Lee. Next, we're going to have a scripture reading by Sean Ganey. The scripture reading for today is Mark chapter 10 verses, or chapter 11 verses 1 through 10. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell him, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people were standing there and asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, shouted Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you, Sean. Now, folks, something amazing happened this week. Phil Gully learned new technology. It, it was just a miracle. I can't explain it any other way. Phil recorded himself, negating the need for me to meet with him in person. Uh, and he was able to capture his audio, capture his video, and send it to me. And I'm happy to share Phil's message now with you. We will have some silent worship after that. And then I will see you all next week. Sorry, folks, one more thing before Phil's message. I do want to thank Ike Homan and Lee Edmondson for the music this week. I want to thank Joanne Gully, Sean and Amanda Ganey, Laura J. Ballinger, Tony Homan, Paige and Tim Settles, J.B. Simons, for their contributions, and of course, Phil Gully, who will give the message now. Thank you. Good morning, friends. When a pastor is dependent upon human interaction for their sermon illustrations, social distancing can be alarming. I never realized just how dependent I'd become upon the Clayton Cafe for inspiration. But I stayed away from other people the entire week except to buy an oil filter and oil for my lawnmower. And would have been better staying home given the discussion I was privy to at the auto parts store. Another customer asked the cashier if she thought the coronavirus was God's way of punishing America for our sin. I could tell by the way the customer asked that he himself believed that to be the case. I felt sorry for the cashier, who apparently hadn't been told when she'd be hired that a theological degree might be useful. She looked at the man and said, how should I know? I'm not the Pope which I thought was the best answer ever. Then the customer turned and looked at me. I prayed, please ask me, please ask me. I've been thinking about this stuff for 36 years. Please ask me, but he didn't. He paid for his things and left. There are people who interpret every event not as an arbitrary act of nature to which we are all vulnerable, but as a premeditated act of God and intended to punish. These are the folks who believe that when something catastrophic happens, God must be behind it. This past week, I dug out a book called The Last Week, written by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. It's a day-by-day -day account of Jesus' final week in Jerusalem. Borg and Crossan do a wonderful job of explaining the historical background of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter, all of which were initially political events, though the church would eventually overlay spiritual themes on top of them. Incidentally, we do this all the time. Some profound shift or calamity will happen, and before long, people will start saying it was God's plan, part of God's great design. This happened almost immediately after Jesus was killed. What was clearly a political assassination became something God required in order to save the human race from our sin. 
But these are not acts of God. They are acts of humans. That was clearly the case with the murder of Jesus. The political elites, the wealthy, the religiously powerful, the privileged few who stood to benefit from things remaining just as they were, the caretakers of a system of domination could not abide the challenge of Jesus, so they silenced him. The murder of Jesus was not a sacrifice for our sin. It was a political assassination intended to keep people in line. Into this system of domination came Jesus, lifting up the poor, stirring their imaginations, talking of a God whose ambassadors weren't the folks in high places, but instead were the meek and lowly, the lovers of peace, the friends of justice. He told how when God threw a party, he didn't consult the social register, but went out into the highways and the hedges, opening heaven's gates to the have-nots, has-beens, and homeless. Jesus entered Jerusalem at the start of Passover, the largest Jewish holiday. Jerusalem was the epicenter of the celebration and the temple was its ground zero. During Passover, the population of Jerusalem would swell with people. Think of the Indianapolis 500 and the Super Bowl held on the same weekend in the same city. Into this mob of people came two processions as different as could be. One procession was small, led by Jesus riding a donkey. The other procession was larger, an occupying force of Roman troops sent by Pontius Pilate to maintain order in what was typically a politically charged and explosive week in the furthest corner of the Roman Empire. Those two processions met later in the week. The folks with the biggest army prevailed, as they usually do, and Jesus was murdered. As I said, the church, in trying to make sense of Jesus' death, reinterpreted his death, giving it religious and spiritual significance. That is natural when we experience something devastating. We try to discern God's role in that event, just like the man I overheard at the auto parts store trying to make sense of the coronavirus. But sometimes we imagine God where God isn't. This requires us to reconsider what we've been taught about God, which can be difficult and painful, especially if we've gotten comfortable with our faith and don't want it to change. But it can also be exciting and exhilarating, invigorating to look at God with new eyes. It can open our lives to other possibilities and help us understand ourselves and the world in a more helpful, healthy way. When we read the Palm Sunday and Easter stories this week, we don't have to interpret those events the way we always have, as a blood sacrifice demanded by God so we could be forgiven. We Quakers, with our testimony of peace, need to be especially careful about suggesting God had to resort to violence to accomplish his purposes. We can instead read and hear these stories and understand them in fresh ways. We can, for instance, be deeply moved by the courage of Jesus and ask God to help us be daring and bold, speaking and acting with moral clarity whenever we see injustice, just like Jesus did.
the people who welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem believed he would lead them in a violent overthrow against a despised Roman regime. But regime change can be a tricky matter and doesn't always lead to a promised land. We're seeing that now, aren't we? During his life, but especially in his last week, Jesus showed us how to live, how to battle injustice, not with violence, not repaying evil with evil, but engaging the world with equal measures of compassion, straight talk, goodwill, and courage. When we do that, we don't need to count on God to intervene and set things right. We will do that ourselves, transforming the kingdoms of this earth into the kingdoms of our Lord, where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like ever-flowing streams. Have a good Palm Sunday. Remember that you are loved and that the people at Fairfield Friends cherish and value each of you. Take care.